But all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice How great is our God, sing with me our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age He stands, and time is in His hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The sermon that sounds very grand, doesn't it? Um, I'm going to speak in a minute, um, but I think just before that, I'll show uh, a little clip. Um, there isn't um, there isn't a Sunday class today, um, um, but we'll watch this clip and I'll try and make my uh, sermon quite short if I can. Um, I have a tendency to go on, I'm afraid. Um, but here's a clip, and this clip is actually taken from the Jesus Storybook Bible. Uh, which I do recommend, uh, and it's um, read by, I think it's David Suchet, David Suchet. and it's the story um, that Rosemary just um, read to us, but it also actually has a little bit from Mark chapter 9, which is where Jesus uses a little child to talk about leadership as well, so hopefully. Zonder Kids presents the Jesus Storybook Bible. Every story whispers his name. Written by Sally Lloyd-Jones and read by David Suchet.
the friend of little children. Jesus' friends were arguing. Who was the most important helper in God's kingdom, they wanted to know. I am, James said. No, you're not, said Peter. I am. Nonsense, Matthew said. I'm the cleverest. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Yes, no, I am. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. This silliness went on and on like that for some time. You see, Jesus' friends had started thinking they had to do something to make themselves special to Jesus, that if they were the cleverest or the nicest or something, Jesus would like them best. But they had forgotten something, something God had been teaching his people all through the years, that no matter how clever you are, or how good you are, or how rich you are, or how nice you are, or how important you are, none of it makes any difference. Because God's love is a gift. And as anyone will tell you, the whole thing about a gift is it's free. All you have to do is reach out your hands and take it. So while Jesus' friends were arguing, some people who knew all about getting gifts, in fact, you might say they were gift experts, had come to see Jesus. Who were they? <laughs> they were little children. Jesus' helpers tried to send them away. Uh, Jesus doesn't have time for you, they said. He's too tired. But they were wrong. Jesus always had time for children. Don't ever send them away, Jesus said. Bring the little ones to me. Now, if you had been there, what do you think? Would you have had to line up quietly to see Jesus? Do you think Jesus would have asked you how good you'd been before he'd give you a hug? Would you have had to be on your best behaviour and get dressed up and not speak until you're spoken to? Or... Would you have done just what these children did? Run straight up to Jesus and let him pick you up in his arms and swing you and kiss you and hug you and then sit you on his lap and listen to your stories and your chats. You see, children loved Jesus and they knew they didn't need to do anything special for Jesus to love them. All they needed to do was to run into his arms and so that's just what they did. Well, after all the laughing and games, Jesus turned to his helpers and said, No matter how big you grow, never grow up so much that you lose your child's heart, full of trust in God. Be like these children. They are the most important in my kingdom. That's good, isn't it? The Jesus Storybook Bible. Um, I, I've called my sermon today um, uh, The Embrace of Jesus. Um, and it's Mark chapter 10, verse 13 to 16. Um, I'm just going to pose a little question, which I'll come back to in a minute. Uh, but my question is, what makes you angry? What makes you angry? Um, obviously, I'm in Market Baptist Church, and I'm sure many of you aren't, aren't angry people or don't get angry. But I wonder what makes you angry, and if any situation has angered you um, in this last week. And uh, as I say, I'll come back to that uh, in a little bit. Um, our story today, um, the NIV Bible calls it or entitles it Jesus and Little Children. And it's a story, I think, that's very easy to kind of gloss over. Um, if you know your Bible, you probably have heard this story before. It's a short story. Um, it seems a very simple story. Um, and it's quite an easy story to kind of sentimentalize as well, isn't it? Oh, Jesus and little children. Oh, we love little children. So it's, it's quite an easy story not to take seriously and to kind of pass over it quite quickly. Um, but I think that's a mistake. And I think there's something here that's important um, and something that's important to us. Um, and I think it's about how to receive the kingdom 
of God and how to miss out. How to be a disciple and how not to be. And the irony of the story, of course, is that the disciples of Jesus show exactly how not to be a disciple. Uh, as often in Mark's gospel, I'm afraid the disciples get it wrong again. Um, but they're a great example to us. Back to anger. Have you thought of anything? <laughs> uh, I don't think I'll ask you to share what things have made you angry. Um, but it is interesting, mm -hmm. isn't it? What issues, what circumstances make you angry? Um, I don't know about you. Um, this is a little bit flippant, but car parks make me increasingly angry. <laughs> Have you? Yeah, I don't know what it, they're just becoming really complicated places. Have you noticed this? You need, I was at Amersham Station yesterday. You need, and I've got three parking apps on my phone. And yet I never have a right one when I go to a new park, a car park. Okay, then you can't get the signal. Then you've got to put your card details in. Then it won't accept the code, but you meant to put, I could go on. In fact, it's funny here that you can make yourself angry, can't you, by, by bringing this stuff back to mind. Uh, we did also, we also got fined when we were on holiday because, um, I can share the story, this isn't it, but um, we didn't manage to pay within 10 minutes of being in the parking space, the parking space we were in for 10 hours, um, and we got charged £100 for it, which made me quite angry. Okay. Um, but anger, is it's a kind of a signal emotion, isn't it, anger? And I think, um, I think anger shows that something's happening, and it might show what we care about as well, might it, when we find ourselves getting angry. Um, and of course, it's often the way we express our anger that's a problem, isn't it? You know, if I'd have been banging my head against that car parking machine yesterday, it would, wouldn't have been right. Um, but it, it says something about us, doesn't it, anger? And what, what winds us up, and what makes us angry? And um, in this story, Jesus is angry. Did you notice it in verse 14? Jesus was indignant. Mark's gospel actually is the only gospel that uh, has that phrase in um, for this story. Jesus was indignant. I looked at what indignant meant. It means feeling or showing anger at what is perceived as unfair treatment. Because of course it is right I probably should say this, it is right sometimes to feel angry, isn't it? I think there are things in the world today that we ought to feel angry about. In fact, reading the news, you often, I don't know about you, but you can often find yourselves feeling angry, can't you? There's been some stories in the news recently that, that I think we should have that response to, shouldn't we? Um, when Jesus shows strong emotions, I think it's always worth being really looking into that because I think when Jesus shows strong emotions there is something at stake there's something vital happening and in this story at stake is receiving the kingdom or missing out getting it right or getting it wrong and the disciples I have to say get it wrong and by extension we can get it wrong really easily can't we the disciples, um, they're, they're the insiders, aren't they? They are those who are given the secrets of the kingdom. Jesus says this, doesn't he? They are those who are called by Jesus. They are given authority by, um, by Jesus. They're given authority to preach, to cast out demons. They are the leaders. Jesus is embarking on leadership training, isn't he? He didn't call it that, but that's what he was doing with his disciples. Uh, and this story in Mark chapter 10 is, is close to the end of Jesus's ministry. And um, very soon we're into the passion in the last week of Jesus's life. He knew his time was limited. So the disciples are given this and they think that it makes them important. They think 
but they can act as the gatekeepers to God's kingdom. They think that means they can decide who's in and who's out. Who deserves Jesus' time and who doesn't, quite frankly. Um, and they're a bit like bouncers. That's, that's kind of how I thought of them here. You know, they're kind of the people on the gate, um, you know, who are there saying, you know, your name's not down, you're not coming in, kind of thing. Um, and they're limiting, they're actually limiting the kingdom. They're limiting the reach of Jesus. And this is what makes Jesus angry. Children, no way. Children, they're not worth it. A waste of time. You know, Jesus' time is limited. He's an important person. He's not got time for children. You know, come back when you've grown up and you've got something interesting to do or say or offer. Okay, that's what the disciples think. How quickly they've forgotten. If you look in Mark chapter 9, verse 37, Jesus has said there, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. Well, they seem to have forgotten that. But maybe it's not just the disciples, is it? Sometimes do we act like this? Do we think that we are gatekeepers? Do we draw lines? deciding who's in and who's out. The danger, I think, is that we forget that it's God's kingdom. It's not our kingdom. We're not in control. It's God's terms. It's not our terms. And the kingdom of God is always surprising. I think that's what I, when I read the Gospels, which I don't really do as much as I should, but when I read the Gospels, it's always surprising. Jesus always catches me off guard. I still find that I read something and it, what do they say? They say, um, it what the saying is that it, it unsettles the comfortable and I can't remember it. I'm not going to read that. But it is that idea it always unsettles because there's always a way in which I'm trying to limit the kingdom of God. I'm trying to limit what God is doing. The kingdom is always surprising. It's always confounding us. It's always challenging us. It's always looking to break us out of our categories, out of our limitations. There is a wideness in God's mercy. There's a song about that, isn't there? I had to look at it on YouTube, but it was the tune was a bit strange. But there's a wideness in God's mercy that many of us just struggle to comprehend and to imagine. Um, I've been challenged in, in the last few months uh, with the parable of the sower. Uh, Nick preached on it a while back, uh, and I was uh, in Lincolnshire, and a chapel I went to, they preached on it there. The liberality of the sower, the, the extravagance of the sower, that they sow the seed everywhere, even in the most unpromising places, even in the barren places, even in the places where you think that will never come to anything. It goes there. And as a teacher as well, I think, you know, I teach, sometimes I teach maybe, well, over 120 people in one day. And I have that possibility to sow something. And even if I think that, they'll never get it. It's not for them. They'll, you know, this will never land. I need to do it because the sower is liberal. The seed goes everywhere. So that's how to get it wrong. How to get it wrong is to limit God's kingdom. How to get it wrong is to impose our thoughts on who's welcome and who's not who, who is jesus for and who isn't he for well that's that's not for us okay how do we get it right because jesus is a great teacher so he immediately shows them the, the solution how do you get it right well how do you receive the kingdom look at these children 
That's how you do it. Receive the kingdom like they do. They bring nothing with them to Jesus. They don't have any status. They don't have any qualifications. They don't have achievements to bring to him. They simply respond with simplicity and dependency to Jesus. Being childlike, not childish, but childlike means recognizing grace. Nothing God gives us is deserved. It's free. It was on the video, wasn't it? It's a gift. We receive it. What do you do to receive something? You just open your hands, don't you? Say thank you. That's good, isn't it? But you just receive it. The blessing of Jesus is a gift. There's nothing these children did to deserve it. It was probably their fathers, actually, who brought them to Jesus in this story. Uh, the word Mark uses for children is up to the age of 12 as well. So it's possible that some of these children were perhaps not babes in arms necessarily. What did they do to deserve the blessing of Jesus? Nothing. He blessed them. He opened his hands to them. He blessed them with the inheritance. Receive an inheritance. There's some very interesting echoes. I've got time to talk about it, but uh, from the Old Testament, blessing in the Old Testament, Genesis 48, where Jacob blesses the sons of Joseph. The language used is very, very similar here to Jesus blessing the children. You just have to receive. Are we dependent on Jesus? Or do we pride ourselves? And I choose that word uh, on purpose. Do we pride ourselves on our independence or on our self-reliance? Um, do we come in simplicity to Jesus? I think Paul once says, I think it's probably in 2 Corinthians, Paul once says, I worry that you will lose the simplicity that is in Christ. Do we come in simplicity? Or do we come dragging our status with us? Do we come with our achievements, with our possessions to Jesus? Interestingly, the very next story in Mark's gospel is the rich young man. And he doesn't enter the kingdom. He leaves with sadness because he comes with his possessions, with his status. And he's a good man. I mean, I wonder, well, I don't need to wonder too much because it's in Mark's gospel, if you read it, what the reaction of the disciples was to him. Because you can imagine them kind of saying, wow, Look at this guy. Think what this guy can do in the kingdom. He's a good man. He's got resources. Think what he could offer. But Jesus challenges him and he leaves, doesn't he? Because he comes bringing things with him. Whereas the children come in their simplicity. Dependence simplicity, trust, dare I say it, helplessness. It's God's kingdom. We must come on God's terms. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. That's what Jesus said. The kingdom is for people who recognize their need and delight in the embrace of Jesus. And we can be those people today, can't we? Let's pray for, and Tony already did it so brilliantly, let's pray for and bless the children in our lives and in our communities. Many of you may have grown up children. They're still children, aren't they? They're still children to you. Let's bless them and pray for them. Let's cultivate a childlike spirit and thank Jesus that he always has time for us. Again, Nick talked about time, didn't he, a couple of weeks ago. 
Jesus always has time. He always has time for you. Yeah, he's never too busy. He always has time. He had time for the woman. He was on his way to a rich, uh, Jairus' daughter, wasn't it? He was a rich and important man of status. Must go to Jairus, must go there, must deal with that. And yet he turns aside, doesn't he? To the woman with the issue of blood. Because he has time for her. Let's be humble and open and sensitive to the ever surprising love and grace of our kingdom's king. That's our prayer today. My prayer for you. Receive the kingdom like little children. Amen. We are going to uh, finish our service with uh, a song. Um, the song which I really like, <laughs> which is why I've chosen it. When I see the beauty, and it's a song that just talks about just such a natural response uh, to wanting to worship God. When I see the beauty of a sunset glory, amazing artistry across the evening sky. When I feel the mystery of a distant galaxy, it awes and humbles me to be loved by a God so high. Can I do? Hallelujah, hallelujah, what can I do?